Hey team, Coach Hay here, and welcome to Unit 3, The Enlightenment. This is going to be a quick two-part unit just to give you all the information that you need to know so that we can have everything we need for Unit 4, The Age of Colonization. So we're going to briefly discuss over the next two class periods, The Enlightenment. I ask that you please pause the video and go over the enduring understandings and guiding questions for this unit. So, today is Unit 3, Day 1, Let's Get Enlightened. After watching Crash Course History, the Enlightenment, learners will be able to cite evidence through 12 text-based questions, scoring 66% after revision RH9.10.1. Okay, so at the end of this video, independently on your Google Classroom, there is a link to a video. I need you to open up that video with whatever device, well, you're watching this YouTube video on, and review the video and answer the 12 questions that correspond to that video. That's what we'll be doing today. Remember, if you need to revise, there's a YouTube tutorial for that too. So we have discussed in Unit 1 and Unit 2 that Europe was largely held back scientifically to the Eastern world. Uh, a lot of this just had to do with the control structure as well as the lack of viable agriculture due to the colder climate. Um, a lot of factors were going against it, bubonic plague as well as the Little Ice Age. A lot was really going against Europe at this time. And, but out of the darkness comes light. And one of the most important aspects, of course, is the scientific method. The scientific method you should review in biology is observation, hypothesis, experiment, analysis, and communication. This will change the world. Because here now we have a scope of which to uniformly test our hypotheses. We can test why things in our world can happen. And this is revolutionary for the scientists, but scientists are working on certain objects, but the purveyors of civilization start to look at the scientific method and question, could we apply that to our world? And this becomes the Enlightenment. It's also known as the Age of Reason, but the Enlightenment was an intellectual movement that stressed reason and thought and the power of the individual to solve problems. This scientific revolution will completely change Europe and push it into the future. So there are many Enlightenment thinkers, but right now I want to focus on two of them that come out of jolly old England. One side, in one corner, we have Thomas Hobbes, and the other, the immortal John Locke. So Thomas Hobbes, he is expressed his views in a work called The Leviathan in 1651. <clears throat> This man has just watched the horrors of the English Civil War nearly rip the nation apart. The war, uh, the House of Lancaster with the White Rose and the House, uh, or the House of Lancaster with the Red Rose and the House of York with the White Rose battled incessantly. This is also following the Hundred Years' War. Hobbes is just seeing all of this death and disruption, and he just believes that humans are naturally selfish and wicked. So, without government, Hobbes postulates that there would be a war of every man against every man. Life will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Simply put, Hobbes comes to the conclusion the only way to avoid all of the terrible nature of humanity is having an absolute ruler. He believes that the best government is an absolute monarchy. An absolute monarchy is a monarchy in which a monarch holds supreme autocratic authority, principally not being restricted by written laws, legislature, or customs. Hobbes is not well remembered today because 
Well, today we would consider this person to be a dictator. But Hobbes argued that it was only with an absolute monarch that humans could escape the bleakness of their own humanity if they handed over their rights to this ruler that would give to them what is best for them, law and order. Hobbes called this agreement the social contract. The social contract is you give your rights to the government, and the government gives you the laws and orders that will govern your society. On the other side, though, there's this guy, this enormous schnoz demand, John Locke. He went the other direction with it. And he says, as reasonable beings, they have, us humans, have the natural ability to govern their own affairs and to look after the welfare of society. This is revolutionary because he's not just suggesting that we as humans have the ability to look after ourselves. But it is in that self-interest that we will look after each other. Locke is basically saying that since humans, well, we are pretty weak compared to most alpha predators. What do we have? Our reason and our thumbs. And he suggests that reason enables us to self-govern. He criticized absolute monarchs and believed in self-governance. His principles that are gonna sound very familiar to you, are life, liberty, and property. He refers to them as natural rights, that we are born free and equal, and the three things that are promised to us are life, liberty, and property. If that does sound familiar, it was aped in the American Constitution, or Declaration of Independence, as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The easiest way to remember Locke's three laws is to protect your property, you lock it up. So according to Locke, the purpose of the government is to protect your rights. And if a government fails to protect your life, liberty, and property, it is the citizen's right, if not duty, to overthrow it. His theory has a deep influence on modern political thinking. He is seen in every revolution of this time and most republics of today. It's the basis of the modern democracy and republic systems, either by pen, as we see at the bottom corner where the U.S. Continental Congress signs the Declaration of Independence, or by the saber, as we see uh, Toulon taking the, or slaughtering the French and declaring Haiti's independence by pen, or by saber, it is the citizen's right to overthrow an unjust government. So this idea that citizens have the right to overthrow an unjust ruler is considered to be popular consent. What popular consent is, is the idea that a government must deride its power from the consent of the people it's governing. So the social contract here is still in play. The populace is still giving their government the job of protecting their rights. And as long as the majority, generally the vast majority of civilization says that they are doing an adequate job, that is a just rule. Uh, history's favorite hypocrite, Thomas Jefferson, says it such. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. So where does this movement really hit its peak? Well, that's in France, Paris particularly. In the mid 1700s, Paris becomes the meeting place for most of the intellectuals of the Western world. This is where Ben Franklin and Adams will spend their days. Especially noted, um, noted great thinker Benjamin Franklin will spend a great deal of time in the salons. So what is a salon? Well, the social critics of the period were known as philosophes. That's French for philosophers. And the there was no TV at this time, no internet, no PS4, 
there was barely even sports. So wealthy aristocratic women didn't have a lot to do with their time because the peasants were too busy trying to not die of starvation and the rulers were busy with their exploitation of the quote unquote new world and the aristocratic women or the aristocratic women well they decided to entertain themselves by hosting salons a salon would be a informal gathering of philosophers theologians anybody who is very interesting very smart and they would have them over they would host them and they would engage in fierce debate and discussion and really hash out their ideologies and the philosophes came to the conclusion largely that people could apply reason and the scientific method to their own lives the five concepts that are really drilled down into the enlightenment are these five one reason enlightened thinkers believed that truth could be discovered through reason or logical thinking nature that which was natural was good and reasonable happiness that people urged to seek well-being on earth progress it was believed that society and mankind could be improved and finally liberty the philosophers called for the liberties that the english people had won in their glorious revolution and their bill of rights so this is a this is from the ye old times this, 18th century to the today we cherish liberty especially here in america uh it's all we ever talk about but we have to understand that liberty cannot be uh liberty until all enjoy it thus progress so liberty and progress are completely intertwined the most famous of all of these individuals, of course, will be Voltaire. Probably the most brilliant and influential of all the philosophes was Francois-Marie Aronet, also known by his pen name, Voltaire. So Voltaire published 70 odd books, uh, political essays, philosophies, and dramas, which primarily critiqued the aristocratic methods of France. You'll learn more about him in today's Crash Course History. But just about everybody knows him from this quote. Since Voltaire never stopped fighting for tolerance, reason, freedom of religion, belief, freedom of speech, he summed up this staunch belief of liberty to one famous quote. I do not agree with a word you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Just so you know that Coach Hay was never cool. That was my high school yearbook quote. But here's the kicker, and you can tell I should have been better at history since I teach history now. Did he actually say it? No. A, a late biographer of Voltaire actually credited it to him. Uh, there's no historical evidence that he uttered such an infamous phrase. And here you are to the video. So you can find this on your Google Classroom. There's a link um, in the classroom and your independent practice. So please go on, watch the video, answer the 12 questions, and I'll see you next time. So for Coach Hay, be smart, be safe. See you next time, guys.